So it's cutting across, my brother. It's cutting across. Because even if you're saying that um, you know your 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 client is a bank, uh, mm. if a bank their branches are closed, uh, the you know the people can't move uh, easily. Their staff can't move easily. They can't disburse loans. They can't collect loans. You know, a mm. um, customer who's supposed to deposit and pay a loan can't pay. Eh? So uh, it is a, it's a challenge. It is a challenge. First, first of all, first salute or wait till we is here. You can't continue just. I, I tell you, I, I, I was waiting to just find that breather. Hey, good afternoon, <laughs> wait till we. Had you on mute, sir? You're on mute, Sebo. I had okay. had you on mute. Okay, now he's unmuted. I've unmuted myself. Assalamu alaikum, Allah barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam, Allah barakatuh. How do I look? Do you see my face? Hey, we see hey, you. You look nice. <laughs> you look you look much better than you, you were three four years ago. So I don't know what is the secret. <laughs> secret is in fasting. Yeah. Good. So constant. Yes, sir. <laughs> now I I don't have any PowerPoint things. Yes. Uh, because the time was not there for me to prepare those things. But I have my notes here. I will be sp speaking of notes. Yes. Uh, and uh, so tell us what is the, tell us, take us through the procedure before we open up for everybody to come. Yeah. Um, what happened is, what happened is we had a, a brief, a brief before. I don't know why you, why you didn't come in. But um, the program is basically going to run like um, when we start. You are, you are. I'm told you've been asked to give um, to set the to set the scene generally about the impact this COVID-19 has created in in as far as uh, auditing and assurance is concerned. So you you are supposed to give an overview from where you are seated. Eh? Okay. As you see it from where you are seated. Yes. And uh, I'm told you have about 20 to 25 minutes to do that. Yes. And thereafter, a CPA asset will come in and uh, you know delve into the into the technical considerations uh, on the same topic. So basically, you are co-presenting. Ah, okay. Yeah. So so he has about 16 slides. So he thinks about 40 to 45 minutes should be enough. And thereafter, we will definitely, there will be questions coming through on the Q&A board. So maybe after those presentations, you can attend to them together. You will be able to choose who is taking which one. Haji, are we still with you? His, uh, his video is gone. Yeah, he seems to have been. Uh, but he's still frozen. Gone. Yeah, he's it, back, I think. Like, sorry, I mean, it, his name is on, but uh, he's not visible. Yeah, uh, it, it, it could be a freeze. Eh? Yeah, and it, off he goes. He's, yeah. now, he's, he's, now, he's now the host. Uh, if I'm seeing a, a thing there, he's clicked a wrong button. <laughs> No, I, I think uh, I think when it, I think Peter 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 moved off, yeah. mm. and when he moved off, it automatically chose uh, Professor as the host. <laughs> mm. Okay, yeah. now we do have um, seventy-eight participants already. I think, if I'm not mistaken, so I don't know how yes. we shall. Uh, uh, exactly, on, at two on the dot, we'll start. Mm. Yeah, so I will do the opening. I will introduce you people, and then we start the job. Hmm. Okay. I think participants have already joined. From what I'm seeing. Yeah, participants are in now. Yes. But unfortunately, Peter, who is our technical person, has dropped off. JB. Come on. We have uh, we have participants who have already joined, but Peter seems to have jumped off. 
Uh, let me check him. You seem to have jumped off with Dora. Okay. Pardon? Ah, okay. Constant Ambrose, everybody's mute. Yes, Hello, Professor, Const you, you are welcome. You are back. Yeah, we had a power problem here, but I'm back here now. Okay, that's good. Uh, shortly, we should be starting. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm ready. No problem. So, so we have um, we have 153 attend attendees so far. And I think we are ready to start now. Um, a warm welcome to all of you, um, members and friends of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Uganda. As usual, uh, with all, as it is the practice with all the East Power activities, we are going to start with a word of prayer. And I'm going to take this opportunity to lead that prayer. God, we thank you so much for the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Uganda, ISPAO. We thank you for the opportunity that you've given us to serve humanity. We thank you for this webinar that the Institute has organized for us. We ask you to be with us. We ask you to give wisdom to all of us, to the presenters, and to the friends of the Institute that have joined. We pray in God's name. Amen. Amen. So thank you once again, members, for joining this webinar. And uh, the webinar is on uh, account, accounting, auditing, and assurance. Let me introduce myself as your moderator for this afternoon. I'm CPA Constant Othieno Mayende, a council member at the Institute and also a practitioner with the CMK and company. So today, today we are we are looking at what we are looking at how this COVID-19 has affected the audit and assurance services function in our market. 
and the topic is uh, demonstrating leadership in COVID-19, practical audit and uh, assurance considerations. We are, we are of course faced with, the, with what we've never seen before, at least in this generation of ours, where we are facing challenges, we are facing extreme challenges, organizations of all sizes across the world actually are facing challenges. And um, these challenges are quickly changing the way how entities are operating, how we live as individuals and how we work. It's, un it's unbelievable that for the last two months almost, we've been holding all our discussions online and we had never thought about this before. And of course, the audit and assurance uh, services also has been affected. And yet we need to continue to comply with our standards. We need to continue to comply with the laws and regulations. So it means we need to think of ways of doing things differently. It's not going to be business as usual. So as an institute, we thought we would come up with a, a topic like this to help mainly our practitioners, but also the accountants in the industry, because you have to prepare for these, um, for these audits. So ladies and gentlemen, with me this afternoon, I have a panel of two experts who speak for themselves actually, but I'm going to attempt to introduce them. Um, our first panelist for this afternoon is uh, CPA Associate Professor Twaha Chigongo Kawase, who is an accountant, he's very well known in this market. He's been in the business for over 30 years. He holds a BCom of accounting major from Makerere University, postgraduate diploma in development finance and a master of social science in accounting and development finance from the University of Birmingham in the UK. He's an FCCA. He's a member, a very active member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Uganda. He's a certified corporate governance trainer. He holds a PhD in accounting from the University of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and is currently practicing uh, with, um, with the Sejaka, Kawasa and Company, which is now part of the SNG network. Uh, Associate Professor Kawasa is a senior lecturer at Makere University Business School and is an examiner at the university, is an external examiner at the University of Swaziland. He's been in the industry, held various positions um, at, in the insurance industry in Uganda, and also Uganda Development Bank before he joined private practice. He sits on various boards. He's a, you, um, he's a chairman of Uganda Health Marketing Group, uh, he's been a chairman before for Uga, of Capital Markets Authority. He's served on the board of Civil Aviation Authority, National Planning Authority, and also National Bank of Commerce, uh, and CBS Radio, and so many others. He's basically a man with so much experience uh, you know, in the boardroom. He has also served as a member of SCCA, uh, network in Uganda here, and um, in 2014, Associate Professor Kawase was appointed as a technical advisor to the IFAC SMP, um, that is Small and Medium Practices, that's an International Federation of Accountants, um, Small and Medium Practices Committee in New York, and um, in January 2016, he became a full member of that committee. Of course, I do not have to forget the fact that uh, Associate Professor Kawase is a member of the Public Accountants Examinations Board of ISPAW, that is PAYEB. Uh, Associate Professor Kawase is a man of service to the community. In addition to the service, he, he, he continuously offers to the Institute. He has since 2000, since the year 2000, served the Kingdom of Uganda in various capacities. In 2013, he was appointed the deputy Katikiro, and I think uh, he's the one in charge of modernizing the kingdom. So welcome, Associate Professor. Uh, 
CPA uh, Dr. Tuwaha Chigongo Kawase. Uh, the next... Thank you. The next, the next panel member is uh, CPA Asad Lukwago. CPA Asad is a partner in the KPMG East Africa. He's in uh, the audit practice of KPMG East Africa. He joined KPMG long ago, over 18 years ago, and he has accumulated over 19 years experience. Nine of, the, nine of those years were in the UK. He brings in a wealth of local and international experience in auditing, in, in, in banking, insurance, telecom, natural resources, private equity, pension fund management, and so on. He holds a BCom from Makere University Business School and is an FCCA. He's also a member of the Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Uganda and Rwanda. He holds a master's degree in wealth management uh, from the Chartered Institute for Securities and Investments in the UK. He's led a number of local and international audits uh, in Uganda here, especially would be the names to note would be, I mean, the major names, NSSF, Meme, and so on, those major names that you, you, you can think of. And um, he, has, he has led a number of local and international public technical trainings um, for example, to the, to the members of the Jersey Funds Association in the UK and to other organizations like SG, Ambrose Bank in the UK, Bank of Uganda, NSSF, and, some, and so many more others. So he's, he's a very good man in analyzing geopolitical and economic analysis over the, uh, the national uh, budget commentary, commentary in Uganda. So CPA Asad, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Pastor. Okay, so we are going to set the ball rolling and um, I'm going to ask Associate uh, CPA Associate Professor uh, Tuaha Chigongo Kawase to give us, to set the scene for us, you know, from, from where he's sitting what he has observed and what we need to do here as practitioners and uh, even people in the industry. So, uh, Associate Professor, you are welcome to address the people. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, moderator, and uh, go, good afternoon, everybody. Um, you actually had the, the first word, you indicated to us that these are changing times true, they are changing times. And uh, before I, I, I go into the, the topic for today, I just want to give you my understanding of the accountant I'm speaking to. Uh, I'm speaking to five categories of accountants myself. Um, my understanding is the each of these accountants has a perspective of uh, COVID-19 and also has, has been affected somehow and it has to provide uh, leadership in one way or the other, depending on uh, where he's sitting from. And therefore, uh, for us in the kingdom of Uganda, we say, uh, so from your perspective, that is why you, you, you see the the sunshine and the moonlight. Now, number one, I see accountants in the practice and advisory. Uh, they're out there, colleagues who are uh, certifying accounts, who are in consultancy, who are in uh, tax business planning. I group those as uh, accountants in practice and advisory. I see colleagues as accountants in business or in employment. These are colleagues who are number one, who are the CEOs of the big entities you see here, big and small. Um, I'm thinking of the NSSF, I have my accountant there, I am thinking of NC Bank, we have an accountant CEO, I'm thinking of Centenary Bank, we have an accountant, 
in there, I'm thinking of uh, Umeme, colleagues who are there in uh, big entities and also in SMEs who are accountants in employment, accountants as internal auditors, accountants in operations at different levels. So those are also seeing COVID in a different angle. I'm seeing accountants in uh, politics. Hey, we have accountants in politics, colleagues like uh, Honorable Bahati is there, uh, Honorable Nandala Mafavi, and the like. They are there in parliament. COVID-19 is impacting them somehow. And uh, they also have the most strength leadership in a, in, a, in a style from where they are seeing COVID-19. I'm seeing accountants in the academia, um, accountants who are professors, accountants who are lecturers, accountants who are researchers. They are accountants. Um, and you know who is an accountant according to Accountants Act, they are accountants. So they are accountants in there. I'm seeing accountants uh, uh, who are in, uh, can I call all over, triple, double accountants, like myself. I call, I call myself as an accountant in academia, accountant in theory, accountant in practice, accountant in regulation, not yet in politics. Yes, accountant in politics, but the politics of no votes, the politics where the server side just gives you the appointment, but it's politics. We have to balance stakeholders. Now, these accountants, I'm saying, these accountants, all over in, in different fields have experienced COVID-19 effects and they are still experiencing COVID-19 effects. And these are accountants who must think beyond COVID-19 as well. So the topic we were given, the topic was on a demonstration of leadership in the time of crisis. That is the topic I was given. I'll borrow um, my experience from those areas I've mentioned and try to bring out the kind of leadership skills which you require and demonstrate in this kind of environment we are in. First of all, I know my colleague will be talking about auditing specifically, but I can tell you that from an angle of an auditor, um, well, it's, it's not business as usual. First of all, you all you know very well that uh, we are not listed as essential services, something which is, I think I'm fighting with uh, myself and I've this morning been in touch with my president to say, look, I'm an essential service. Tell me who is going to certify the financial statements of insurance companies that have been asked to operate today and file returns. I must go to the office, so I'm essential. So anyway, so there we are, as, so we, if you are listed as an essential, you have no movement permits. So you must call on your dynamic capabilities to be able to operate, to be able to operate and be able to certify your clients. I know you're going to tell me that we can work remotely, you can, uh, but we are in Uganda, come home guys. Um, the clients we are, we, we are servicing are not uh, that much uh, sophisticated. They, they, they are not IT, uh, you know, their IT systems are not that much. There is, you need to be in touch with the client physically most of the time. First of all, to obtain the audit evidence and also be able to assess um, whether you can run away from the potential limitations of scope in getting the audit evidence. So it, it has affected us. So my colleague will be going to deeper into that, uh, the, the specifics. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, look at uh, what sort of leadership skills um, we need to provide. Because I've said you are a leader, you are an accountant, but you are a leader in all the, where you are seated. You, you, people are expecting you to provide guidance. In, in times of crisis like we are in, um, there are some skills you require. Some of them we don't teach in the university. We don't teach them. Nobody is going to teach you how to dodge a roadblock to be able to go and service a client. We don't teach those. Okay, so uh, what is it that we need as accountants, as leaders, but with finance background? First and foremost, we need to have a, a, a name at frequent 
and speed of uh, communication. The point I'm driving here at is a point of engagement. We need to engage all our stakeholders. We need to engage first the internal one. We need the staff to engage the staff so that uh, they know uh, the risks involved on uh, work related matters and the risks involved on learning work related matters. Of course, the life bit of it on their side. Those, those ones that you know now. Nobody says that it's not a way of COVID-19 or whatever it is. But on work, we need to engage them. So on an increasing basis, that is number one, the staff. Number two, this is not a time to hide from your uh, clients. You can reach them out, Akasimu, call them. This is not a time to hide from your suppliers. This is not a time to hide from your financials. This is a time for engagement. This is a time for uh, communication. So you need that kind of uh, skill to be able to get to, to your stakeholders. So we need to maintain morale. Morale. It will be unfortunate that if you are the, the head of the, say, a not practice, um, the CEO, uh, the politician, or the, the academia, and you are nowhere to be seen, you should be available to maintain morale and productivity. You must uh, discuss and be in touch with uh, your staff. It's critical. Don't hide. You must inspire and you need to be creative and uh, very fast in decision making. Very, very fast in decision making. Now, here, when I say fast in decision making, uh, it is important that uh, whatever you do, you do it transparently. Um, if you are engaging with the staff, these are people who know, they are not blind, they are aware of what's going on. So be transparent about your company, what is available and what is uh, the future you, you, you think you're going to, to have as an institution. These are cash flows in, cash flows out. That way they will buy in and you'll be able to take a quick decision on advising them on any drastic measures you are taking. It shouldn't be um, a memo just to everybody. I think that is that one I wouldn't support. I think it has to be uh, an engagement on a one-to-one -one and uh, let everybody understand and buy into what is available. Uh, so, the, the, the moderator indicated that uh, it is a time for IT. Yes, this is, IT is here with us now. It has been here with us always, but uh, from an SMP angle, it has always been just SMP is a small and medium practice. Uh, entity uh, or uh, company, uh, audit firm. It has always been a challenge for us. Uh, technology, we were aware that we need to, to go into technology. So, but this is the time now to rethink and be able to engage with our uh, regulator, who is ICPAU, be able to come up with homegrown uh, systems that are not that expensive, but they will be able to deliver our our audits uh, properly and be able to work remotely as they say but working remotely you've seen has some challenges um i had to find a way of coming to the institute to sit here because power went off at home and the generator is down and i couldn't get the, the, the guy to come and fix the generator so i said okay i'd rather go and sit at the institute. The institute has no power, but has a standby generator. So I'm here. So there are some challenges of, of uh, this new normal which is coming in. 
But I guess we're not going to go back to the old style. We just have to embrace and move on. This is a time when uh, we need to go into looking at our insurance covers. Uh, it is important you, you check the covers you have for all your assets and all your, uh, your, your staff, if it is health insurance, but also professional indemnity covers, we need to check them um, and uh, be able to be on top of, this, of the game. It is a time to tighten our belts and you have to lead from the top. It is a time to see what resources you require, which resources can you do less with. It's a time for uh, engaging uh, discounts, uh, suppliers for discounts. It has never occurred to me that uh, I can refuse to sign an audit opinion before I see a check. <laughs> but uh, the last, from practical experience, I've had about two clients for whom I'm concluding, and uh, I've already signed their opinion, but um, the MD called me and said, Aji, I need these accounts. I said, thank you very much, but uh, can you please look at your suppliers as well and squeeze in somewhere? You'll have my signature when that check docks here, and I stood my ground. So these are times for <laughs> um, looking at your inflows, and that requires you, sometimes you may politely engage your customer and say, look, things have changed. It's not good business. It's not business as usual. I've already signed for you, and I know you'll pay. But now, I want you to go and squeeze your uh, receivables as well. Make sure you come back here for my signature in the pain, because I have have a covenant with my staff, we have agreed on the way forward, I must fulfill that side as well. So these are times that requires you to engage and be able to um, uh, sail through. Of course, they always say um, dark clouds have silver linings and uh, we need to be optimistic here. We need to be optimistic and be able to see the business that is going to come out of this uh, COVID-19. Now, as a practitioner, when I hear um, development partners sending in money, sending in this, okay, I, I see business. I need to position myself or we need to position ourselves to ensure accountability for those funds. As a CEO, as a, a CFO, say a bank, I don't know whether this is, um, if you go to an ATM, I've been going to ATMs. Have you noticed that uh, if you want some substantial monies, they always stack that thing um, with the notes so that you, you insert the card uh, many times. Then I noticed that hey, the more you insert the card, I think that is the more the charges. But I have no evidence whether I'm being overcharged or not. Whether the stacking of the, 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 the notes of a lower, lower denomination is in the, in the ATM at the library. But I, well, I hope my colleagues are ethical and they're not doing it deliberately. Uh, these are times of, uh, the, our codes are still there, code of ethics. Uh, be ethical in, in, in whatever you do. So the silver linings for an accountant who is in business advisory, definitely um, we need to find out opportunities we have, like advising clients on how to manage cash flows and how to uh, engage with any relief packages that are coming on. Um, already banks are availing relief packages. We need to be able to uh, advise our clients on how to go about it. Uh, URA itself is there trying to give us guidance on uh, how to file returns. So we should be available to, uh, to, to, to advise. So in a nutshell, we need resilient leaders. 
uh, we need to be genuine and sincere. And uh, I know in, on the side of staff, we need to be compassionate, but uh, at, them, at the same time, you need to be firm, making sure that the decision you take is a decision to help you sail through the crisis. Because if you don't take the decision, you may collapse, unfortunately, with the crisis. But uh, be bold out there and say, I'm not going to collapse. We did not start this entity to collapse. The entity was started to be a going concern. It's going to be a going concern. I must look out for whatever opportunities that are available. Cheese is moving, but I must look for the cheese wherever it has moved. So find opportunities among us, the difficult constraints and be able to move. Um, so uh, I think with those few remarks, I'll, I'll, I'll wait for uh, comments or questions from uh, colleagues who are out there. Thank you very much, Chair, for the time being. Thank you so much, um, Associate Professor Twaha for, for sharing your thoughts. Um, with the colleagues, the fellow accountants. The, the number of participants is growing. We are now at 465. And to me, this, uh, uh, this shows the level, the, the, the level of enthusiasm that the, profession, the professionals are having. I've actually never seen any, I've never seen any NSCPD, which is attended by this kind of number. <laughs> so th th this is, it's an interesting thing, actually. So uh, members, I would like to draw your attention to the, to the question and answer board. Um, just before CPA Assad comes in to make his presentation, please make use of that board. We will pick your questions from there uh, when we reach the Q&A session. And then the presenters will answer them or they will give you some comments around them. So it's now time for me to, to call upon uh, CPS at Lukwago to make his presentation. I already introduced him. I'm not going to introduce him again. So CPS at please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, with me, you can always introduce. I'm not like a professor uh, CPA Professor Tua, how will you take 30 minutes? My CV is very short. But um, yeah, uh, good afternoon, members. And um, it's uh, very humbling, first of all, um, for me to be seeing uh, the numbers on this call almost clocking to 500. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's not taken for granted uh, to have these many members um, being available on, on such a short notice from, uh, from our beloved institute. So first of all, I would like to thank each one of you uh, for making the time for this webinar. And thanks for our institute for organizing and keeping communication channels open during this um, economic and social lockdown. It's very important. And, and as accountants, these are the best forums for us to, to keep talking and sharing ideas. Um, so I hope all of you and your loved ones are safe and healthy. And I hope the speech from last night was very clear uh, to each one of you so, so that we try to comply with the safety measures in place um, until we get uh, released, maybe in two weeks' time. But uh, going by the levels of attendance, Chairman, looks like even if the lockdown continues, the accountants seem to be having this. So, um, yeah, now going into, into our topic for today, uh, demonstrating leadership in the COVID-19 um, crisis, um, and specifically looking at the key audit and assurance considerations. Um, my topic uh, will be covering um, half the accounting considerations and then half the audit considerations um, naturally. Uh, and so uh, if there are any non-practicing um, accountants on here, uh, I will try to tweak when I get to the audit considerations, I'll try to tweak my presentation so that uh, since you also interact a lot with um, audit departments, uh, it will, for you to be able to be able to prepare um, properly uh, for your interactions with the auditors. So I'll make it relevant for every single CPA who is on, um, on the call. And, and also to mention, I'm sharing a screen right now 
So if there's anyone who is joining through a smaller gadget, uh, you might just need to look at your screen and see whether you can, you can see the PowerPoint uh, presentation. Uh, I know because of the network issues, there might be a lag uh, between when I click to move on to the next part um, versus when you get to see uh, the screen at your end. So you will bear with us, um, but I'm pretty sure we shall all be uh, moving um, together. Now, um, in order to do justice to the topic, I've moved on to the second slide that uh, shows the three agenda items. Uh, in order to do justice to the topic today, which is the key audit and uh, assurance considerations, um, I considered it important to first understand the public expectations of an auditor in these circumstances, especially the regulators. Um, and then we go into the financial reporting implications uh, before we dive into the audit considerations, because naturally you would have expected that um, the financial reporting implications come first before an auditor turns up. So that is how um, the, the, the agenda for today we, we, we will be arranged. And um, we shall just move on into now the bit on auditor expectations. Um, every time, uh, and, and most of you CPAs on, on this call probably know this very well, but every time we have a crisis, um, whenever the dust settles, everyone looks for someone to blame. Uh, you will remember in the dot-com bubble, uh, which took one or two, you know, audit firms with it. Uh, you will remember in the credit crunch uh, crisis in 2007, all the way to 2010, which we had just barely started getting out of. Um, again, when the dust settled, uh, everyone was looking for someone to blame. Uh, when companies make losses because of crisis, when employees lose jobs, you know, because of the same crisis, and when eventually investors lose money uh, and those companies collapse, and when the CEOs are fired, finally, everyone now looks for who to blame because the solutions of firing CEOs and changing board members never recovers the lost jobs, never recovers the lost money, um, but everyone now looks to, to who next to, uh, to blame. And it's not unusual that you've always had words like, where were the auditors? So um, you, the 600 or 500 members also who are on this call, uh, be ready to answer that question maybe a year later, where were you? You know, which um, it's a very unfair state of affairs, uh, unfortunate for our profession. And therefore we need to keep ourselves ahead and maintain professional skepticism during these difficult moments. Um, uh, you will find that uh, when you're practicing, uh, CEOs will want you to use, uh, will want to use your stamp uh, to legitimize um, uh, incorrect um, state of financial affairs uh, for different pressures, uh, whether from bankers, whether from shareholders, uh, for all sorts of reasons. Um, and um, by uh, using you as the auditor um, to, you know, to pass uh, their agenda, it's a very short-sighted solution and very temporary in nature. And when questions like, where were you come, uh, if you didn't do the right thing, unfortunately, it becomes very difficult for you to answer those questions. And it's, that's why I, I think the context of the auditors talk public expectations um, is very important. So my plea to all of you, my fellow CPAs, um, is please maintain professional skepticism and, and do the right thing all the time. Um, once we get out of the lockdown, once we have finished saving lives, uh, because now we're in the mode of saving lives, we've not yet even started the mode of um, economic recovery. Uh, once we are out of this, um, I would urge you CPS to maintain professional skepticism whenever you're playing uh, your roles. Um, I think there's someone who is not on mute, please. Could you, could you just mute so that um, you know we can proceed? Right, so in terms of um, uh, the public expectations, uh, and especially, this is the regulators, uh, I've bulleted out a few areas there, just as um, guides, I'm not going to talk too much about them, but um, one obvious area is that um, the profession has now an opportunity to, re um, to restore confidence created by the uncertainty in the COVID-19 world. Uh, you will find users of financial statements, uh, you will find, uh, well, I think they all fall in the category of users of financial statements, whether they are um, employees, whether they are predators, whether they are customers, whether they are um, lenders or equity investors uh, or competitors, um, just to be you know, um, certain 
that the state of affairs that are being reported by entities is actually the correct state of affairs. And that's an opportunity for us as the profession to restore that confidence. And um, the COVID-19 and the general accounting and all other matters related to that is going to be a key focus area for everyone whenever they are looking at all the work that we're doing um, as, uh, as accountants and as auditors. And then comes the impact on audit quality. You are all very aware that the primary definition of audit quality is the audit opinion. Um, if you issue a wrong audit opinion as an auditor, that is the cardinal sin that the entire ISAs were set up to avoid. Um, so uh, that is the primary definition of audit quality. And uh, a, a wrong opinion might be an opinion that has, um, uh, you know, uh, inappropriate financial reporting um, masked uh, behind that opinion, which you didn't pick up because the circumstances were totally different and unique um, that uh, your internal processes and procedures had never anticipated. So uh, they, 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 there's an expectation and uh, attention will be always on our audit reports. Um, naturally, there are going to be uh, public expectations and, uh, and communication related matters. Um, what is being disclosed uh, first in the auditor's report, you know, our um, key audit matters, but also in the financial statements that uh, we are signing off. Then if you have any disclosures, attention is going to be given to boilerplate related sort of disclosures. That's why you just pick a template somewhere because someone used it and, um, and you use it, whether in um, disclosing the circumstances of the entity or judgments and estimates. Um, so it's important to tailor because each company um, is affected uh, differently. Uh, business continuity is a, a, a clear area where everyone is going to pay attention to. Um, and we are in this together. The people who are running businesses, the finance teams who prepare the financials, and as the auditors who certify those financials, the entire business continuity and survival of the organization and how it's accounted for and reported is an area which is going to be in the limelight. Uh, but ultimately, um, if uh, any non-compliance with laws and regulations or, you know, um, and the NOCLA that you remember came about two or three years ago, um, the impact of that uh, are areas where regulators are, are starting to look. Then uh, the natural question, uh, yes, here we are on a conference um, and uh, seem to be doing a good job, 600 people attending. Uh, but um, um, if you're, you have auditors, whether it's an internal audit department, uh, having to execute its annual plan that were approved by audit committees or the external auditors, um, are you able to work with the accountants? Um, uh, are you able to supervise your teams uh, wherever they are when they're in lockdown? Uh, these are areas which will be um, questioned. I wouldn't be surprised if internal audit departments or members here who are from internal audit departments uh, go to their audit committees towards the end of the year and they explain why many of the processes were never tested. Uh, if I was their audit committee chair, I would ask a good question um, whether they were unable to work together um, amidst the, the lockdown. So those are areas where you, you, you will be challenged and it's important to keep an eye. File assembly, a big, big challenge and um, any external reviewer, um, you know, will have to look at how you did your file assembly. Everything is electronic. There are hard copies that you don't have. Um, what are the cutoff dates, uh, the, the, the statutory and, um, you know, uh, legislative uh, um, assembly dates? Are you complying with those when you all your entire office and uh, uh, staff and clients are locked away? Um, another area is any engagements that are being signed right now um, would be considered high risk. So if there are any external parties who want to review um, and other regulators, those are the sort of um, um, engagements that they will, they will be looking at. Um, now, it will also be an interesting situation if there are any inspections that are supposed to be happening, um, uh, how will they take place in a virtual um, world? Because I believe uh, the world we are in is going to be more of a virtual world with social distancing and the flights and the movements um, are going to be severely restricted. I do not see um, a situation where uh, we shall return to the old days of where inspections are easy and everyone can fly in from wherever to, to come to Uganda to do any inspections. Then questions are going to arise and naturally they will come to us as accountants 
um, around dividend payments and uh, capital raising guidance, um, whether you know, if an entity performed well in 2019, um, uh, you know, uh, and declare dividends, but then they are anticipating that it will struggle in 2020. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if CEOs and shareholders come to you as the finance person, come to you as the external auditor, and ask for your views. Should we pay that dividend? Should we not pay that dividend? Um, capital, you know, do we have enough capital if we are regulated insurance with bank? Um, you know, uh, there may be questions around uh, capital uh, raising guidance. So you as uh, accountants, it's important to make sure that um, you, uh, you're abreast with, uh, with, with what's going on and the implications of all this. So that's in a nutshell what uh, I can pick out as uh, public um, expectations of an auditor or let me say of an accountant. Um, and um, you know you can expound on that um, based on your uh, your technical knowledge to make sure that we, we are ready uh, when business resumes and when all these expectations crystallize that we, we are very well set for that now um, of course as I said I've uh, moved on to another slide so if there is a lag on your side you just be aware I'm moved on to financial reporting impact now um, uh, before I get into the audit considerations I considered it very important to exhaust the financial reporting considerations um, because an audit mainly happens when the bulk of financial reporting processes have already happened. Um, and this is where I mean, most of the, you know, also the non-practicing um, accountants, uh, you know, would be very interested here. Um, so you will find that uh, what COVID-19 has brought is that um, there has been disruption to businesses and there has been disruption on the wider economy um, and these disruptions are significant. They are not just the usual minor hits and they're cutting across almost every single organization. Um, supply chains have been broken. Um, organizations are not able to, to serve their customers. Organizations are not able to collect what they already earned in the previous periods. Um, organizations might struggle to, um, you know, to cater for their obligations as they fall due. Um, and organizations might fail to uh, comply with various covenants or regulatory measures on capital and, and other areas. So there has been a significant um, impl impact of uh, COVID-19 to businesses. And then um, uh, there, there's certainly going to be a potential uh, financial distress, um, especially for those highly exposed sectors, sectors in trade and transportation, sectors in tourism, uh, travel and tourism. Uh, you also uh, Virgin in uh, Australia um, uh, applied for, I think, uh, administration. If I'm not mistaken, you know they they they, they filed for um, administration because they couldn't they couldn't survive just within about two three weeks of uh, um, of this. So and and that is aviation is going to be different. All of you who are following investment the investments are globally. Uh, Warren Buffet, who is always a long term investor. He never buys investments for a short term. He's always a long-term investor. He sold all his stake in, um, in, in um, airlines in the U.S., in the four airlines in the, in the U.S. Uh, and um, just that, to me, is a huge signal uh, about the sector we're talking about. Um, we're not going to return to a world where we crowd out in a, a small airplane uh, and uh, we were 100 people in our, you know, our um, uh, bombardiers, for example, here in Uganda, most likely social distances is going to, to come in. Uh, will those entities be able to, to, uh, to maintain the cost um, of, uh, of running businesses? Hoteliers, people in tour and travel, um, entertainment where you, you rely on crowds being in one place, social distancing, when will it you know, become normal? When will people start trusting each other? Um, um, construction, retail. So all this, why, why I'm getting deep into the actual uh, commercial impact is because the moment there is a commercial impact, immediately there's a financial reporting um, consideration. Um, I, so, and that's why I had to give this preamble that um, the depth of the economic impact um, just immediately speaks into um, financial uh, reporting considerations. And now, um, I've moved on to the next slide, uh, which if it comes later, I, I'll, I'll, I'll say here for a bit. 
um, the, the first area that we need to ask ourselves, are assets being carried at appropriate amounts? Um, specifically, when you, you, you look at um, what is happening, uh, starting off with the, 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 the non-financial, let me call them fixed and uh, intangible assets. Um, in the entire period of the lockdown, most of the factories have been redundant. And, um, and uh, even when the lockdown is lifted, uh, it may be you know, lifted in phases and, um, and pr uh, production may not be at the usual full capacity. So uh, if you look at the IS-36 definition or IS-36 requirement for you to assess impairment is that if there are indicators of impairment and um, honestly speaking, uh, in the current circumstances, uh, because of production, uh, first of all, uh, factories being um, redundant, um, cash generating units, if you're talking about goodwill, uh, are no longer generating cash. They can't even fulfill their own you know, nomenclature, you know, cash generating units. Um, um, and if you look even at the forecast in, in, the, in the future, um, are factories and uh, businesses going to be operating at the old usual um, capacities? Are they going to be producing at the full scale that they used to produce with all the entire breakage in the supply chain? Now, all those are indicators that there's a potential impairment. And if an indicator is met, IS-36 requires you then to go ahead and measure uh, what the impairment is. So if your measure of impairment is either going to be value in use um, and looking at the discounted cash flows of future production, or if you're looking at uh, units um, or, or produced by uh, an equipment, uh, clearly if those units are below the machine's capacity, uh, your result is going to immediately give you an impairment um, to your assets. And that speaks to other um, um, assets as well, the software, um, um, if the purpose for which it was um, meant and the capacity for which it was meant, if it's a, tra a trading platform or a booking, online booking system or whatever it is, if it's not uh, at the capacity that it's supposed to operate, then there are indicators of impairment. And if you actually look at a value in use or fair value, um, you most likely to return uh, an impaired position. Uh, goodwill, I've talked about cash generating units. If you have a branch or a subsidiary in a certain location and it's no longer generating the cash you were expecting, um, clearly there will be an impairment um, to that goodwill um, attributed to uh, that asset. The other area um, with regards to assets is um, uh, fair values. Um, uh, fair values, if you look at what's happening in the world right now, uh, market prices have collapsed. And I'm saying that very well knowing personally that the level at which uh, those prices are is not even the correct uh, position. Uh, the way I normally contextualize this COVID-19 and the lockdown, I use an analogy of um, uh, an accident. If you are in a car and you're down on a slope and you realize your brakes have died, and you see a big you know, stone at the bottom or a big tree at the bottom, you very well know I'm going to crash. Now, in that process, before you crash, you can't start thinking how much will the engine cost? How much will the radiator cost? How much will the lights cost when I crash? What will be the damage? In that moment, you're actually trying to save your life, you know, confirming that your seatbelt is on, sitting properly to absorb the impact. So to me, the moment we're in right now with this lockdown, is that phase before the crash happens. Uh, we are now in busy saving lives, ensuring that each person um, is, uh, survives the COVID uh, pandemic. And um, if you contract it, uh, you isolated and treated quickly. Now, once all the dust settles, our car will have crashed. And that's now when we shall check the proper economic damage that has been done to the country and the businesses. That's when the forces of demand and supply will get back to equilibrium. That's when people will start borrowing for you to see the interest rates that now are ruling. That's when exchange um, foreign currency will start um, moving hands for you to know the true depreciation of the currency. So for now, we are still on the hill rolling down, knowing we're going to crash, but we cannot measure the impact of this crash. I'm bringing that as an analogy for fair value um, determination. So the prices have already um, fallen, 
but they are going to fall even further the moment all the dust settles. So uh, if you have that, uh, counterparty credit risk um, has gone up, but it's going to get, uh, even go higher. Um, so when you factor all those um, aspects um, in your models for calculating fair values, you will find that the fair values of most of the financial instruments are going to collapse, uh, that's for sure. Um, if you're using a DCF and you're looking at uh, future cash flows as a way of calculating your, uh, your fair value, uh, you know, everyone knows clearly what's going to happen, cash flows, if, uh, you know, you're seeing people cutting salaries and employees because they know what is going to happen to future cash flows. If you're looking at current market prices, uh, they've already fallen, uh, if you, you know, if that's your measure of fair value. If you're looking at a willing buyer right now, a recent transaction, who is looking for a financial instrument in this moment when they can't even serve their existing customers. So fair values are definitely going to fall. And the question is whether we as accountants, whether we as auditors will be able to pick that up. Um, taxable profits, if you have deferred tax assets um, on your balance sheets, uh, of course you support those using future taxable profits. The question is, will you have those future taxable profits uh, to extinguish those deferred tax assets? Again, those are questions that we accountants and auditors have to answer and we make sure we address um, in, during our day-to-day -day work. Lease assets, you all know IFRS 16 and the right of use asset that it dumped on every single balance sheet. Um, now that right of use asset, if people are going to go and renegotiate uh, rental contracts um, and uh, therefore the, the future obligation, uh, um, you know, uh, is reducing because of either waivers or, you know, terminations or um, any concessions in the rent, then automatically the liability uh, reduced is matched by the asset. And therefore, the assets you might have on your balance sheet might have to be impaired, even though the good thing with this is that it has a, an equal impact on, uh, on the liabilities as well. Revenue cycle receivables, I should have just used a simple word here, debtors, uh, clearly. I think, um, and knowing, I, I'm going to talk about IFRS 9 on the next slide, but uh, again, uh, impairment right now of receivables is a, a very clear, obvious area for everyone now. Um, and then, uh, capitalization of borrowing costs, uh, you know, you, you know very well what uh, the standard says, that um, you capitalize borrowing costs during the period of construction. Who is constructing now? So um, are you okay to be capitalizing um, borrowing costs? So these are the questions we need to be asking ourselves and make sure that we do the right accounting treatment. Moved on to a next slide, uh, specifically now for financial instruments. Uh, Chairman, I have a tendency of normally talking too much Please, you warn me if you start seeing I'm, be, I'm misbehaving. Um, I will surely do so. Yes, please. Um, financial instruments. Um, uh, uh, and this speaks directly into um, IFRS 9 and um, precisely to expected credit losses. Uh, you know, uh, IFRS 9, it doesn't harm for us to remind ourselves. IFRS 9 uses the concept of expected credit losses and I want to underline the word there, expected. Because normally when you, 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 you tell the board members or, or shareholders that your impairment has gone up because of IFRS 9, and you show them that this account also has an impairment, you say, but I've never lost money from a treasury bill. How can I have an impairment on treasury bill or interbank lending? This is expected. Um, so uh, it's not incurred. So if we are talking about expected credit loss, the one, um, input within IFRS 9 uh, are economic, uh, uh, macroeconomic variables. Things like um, uh, the impact of GDP, impact of inflation, impact of interest rates um, on your future uh, credit losses or on your current um, assets. Uh, um, and uh, clearly, who knows what the future GDP will be next year, 2020, 2021? Who knows what inflation will be? Who knows what interest rates will settle at? Um, so clearly, those macroeconomic forecasts that we used in the 31 December uh, 2019 numbers uh, are going to be thrown out of the window. Uh, we're going to have to remodel uh, based on the new normal uh, post-COVID-19. Um, significant increase in credit risk is another concept that you've always had in IFRS 9, um, uh, where if you underwrite an asset uh, today, of course, every asset has a degree of risk, and that's why you charge them interest. Um, so 
if there is a significant increase in the risk uh, at that point in time, then uh, you have to uh, move that, that um, asset to another band, you know, stage two of impairment or stage three of impairment. So now the question is, in the current circumstances, what is going to constitute a significant increase in credit risk? Um, automatically, almost the entire world has gone through a significant increase in credit risk. Every single person, the risk in, on their organization was uh, lower than it is today. So we need to assess what is now the definition of a significant increase in credit risk, apply to every single data um, and, uh, and, and uh, asset that you have, and see whether your impairments uh, on those financial instruments are still appropriate. Uh, I talked a lot uh, about fair values. I'm not going to repeat that. Hedge accounting is not applied too much in Uganda, uh, but uh, precisely all I can say here for purposes of taking knowledge for those of you who may be using it, is that um, for you to apply hedge accounting, it has to be a perfect hedge. So you can't just say, oh, I have a swap. Uh, you know, I expect to pay out a, a loan in, in, uh, in uh, dollars um, and uh, I have Uganda shillings. Let me borrow a Uganda shilling and, uh, you know, and just hedge the, the arrangement. Um, if you have that, it's not necessarily a hedge. Uh, it has to be a perfect hedge, which means that it, it should be able to eliminate your risk to uh, at least about 5% um, to, uh, in, under any extremes. Now, in these situations, you might find that even all the hedges that people already underwrote and were perfect hedges at the point of um, uh, recognition, they are no longer perfect hedges. They may not be able to hedge the risk anymore. So you might find that now whoever was applying hedge accounting may need to stop and uh, not proceed with hedge accounting. And then there's also a concept uh, of um, own use. Again, I don't want to speak too much about that. Again, it's to do with derivatives, uh, where you, you, um, you, you enter into an arrangement to buy uh, in future, say uh, oil or whatever. Actually, it's used some of our petrol uh, dealers. Um, you, you, you have an arrangement to buy a number of barrels of petrol in future. And, um, and you're saying that that's for your own future use, therefore that's not a hedge arrangement. But then uh, you might find that now in situations, if your business has slowed down significantly and you're already in a contract of buying a whole lot of barrels and everyone is in lockdown, no one is using your petrol, will you actually use that petrol? So you might find that now, instead of that qualifying as just a contract for a future use, it has unfortunately fallen into a bracket of a financial instrument because you have a risk exposure. You will not be able to, to sell all that chunk. Um, yeah, and then ultimately expected credit losses on trade uh, receivables. Clearly, that I think the entire bits of um, macroeconomics, a significant increase in credit risks and uh, probability of default, exposure to default, loss given default, um, all those need to be redefined right now because um, if you have an amortization schedule for a loan uh, that you give out to someone, uh, the, that amortization schedule may not apply for the future term of that loan anymore. Uh, most of the people may come back for renegotiating those. Uh, therefore, when you're determining um, your exposure default or loss given default, past history, uh, past data that you modeled for the past three years cannot apply in the current world in uh, post-COVID-19 uh, because circumstances then are no longer the same um, in the current period. Financial liabilities, the biggest risk here, I moved on to the next slide, guys, so it will come if it's uh, slowing down on your side. Uh, financial liabilities, the key areas there to consider, uh, debt covenants, uh, where most of the people are going to breach debt covenants, either quarterly payments have been breached, or um, profit ratios or interest cover ratios or debt to equity ratios are going to be impacted because of the trading losses people are incurring. Now, if those debt covenants are triggered, that if you breach this covenant, uh, you, the, the lender has the right to recall your loan immediately. If you were classifying that loan as a non-current before, it has automatically become current because you have triggered um, a covenant that gives the other obliger an opportunity to call that loan. And if you remember uh, from your IS-1, uh, the distinction between current and non-current, it uh, falls more on the power of the, uh, the, the lender. 
what the, the rights the lender has to do. Not necessarily, you know, what you can do, but what the lender can do. So if a lender can call it immediately, it doesn't matter what the plan might be or you renegotiate, it doesn't matter, ICE one is strict. So uh, you find that most of what people are classifying as non-current borrowings might be falling into current in the, in the post-COVID world. Then you also have modifications to financial abilities due to change in terms. Uh, you saw Bank of Uganda um, issued a circular uh, advising banks to extend, you know, certain um, concessions to borrowers. Um, and, um, you know, many companies are taking up those, yeah, those, those, those uh, opportunities. So if you modify your financial um, liabilities contract or terms, then you need to check whether uh, per the, the standard definition you have uh, there is a substantial change in the terms of the contract. If your changes in the terms uh, fulfill the 10% the hurdle, that it's a substantial change in the, in the terms of the contract, then you have to account for that change as if you have extinguished the loan and borrowed a new loan. And if at all, when you do your amortization, amortized cost um, calculation, if you get a loss um, on, 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 on the, and at that point, then that loss has to be recognized in your P and L immediately. Um, you know, but if you, you you come up and say that when I look at the uh, the DCF of the future term of the loan and discount back to today, the, the difference between the, the the first value of the loan um, uh, is not uh, more than ten percent, then you just account for it as a, the old existing loan and um, you record a few uh, transactions via PNL. Now, naturally, IFRS 7, you remember, um, when was this? IFRS 7 came along with the credit crunch. Yes, yes, yes. Um, when the credit crunch happened, people were asking, but all these impairments and everything, we, how come auditors never told us that, uh, our accountants never told us the risks of these instruments we are holding? That's when people are talking about securitization and uh, the junk bonds, you know, you remember all those things, uh, you know, the, the mortgages and all that. Um, so IFRS 7 came up with a whole lot of disclosures. I think it's fit for purpose, even today's current circumstances. So do not forget to make sure that your especially liquidity disclosures, where it requires you to forecast uh, for the next five or so years, uh, your liquidity matching um, assets and liabilities and single liquidity gap. Um, in the current COVID-19, uh, you might find that you need to pay a little bit attention in those disclosures there uh, to make sure they are appropriate. Um, moving on, the rest will be a bit quicker. Uh, uh, going concern. Uh, this now tackles both accounting and also audit. Um, going concern is a very, very big matter that we need to consider um, in this COVID-19 uh, world. Uh, as I told you earlier on, uh, supply chains have collapsed. There are certain sectors, you know, and um, where businesses are literally just going to be wiped off um, of the face um, of, the, of, of, of the economy, especially those in uh, tourism, uh, you know. I, I, and you see even from ourselves here, we are able to work virtually. Um, do you really believe that people are going to continue flying in from Europe and everywhere into these countries? So there are certainly some middle companies in there that um, are going to collapse uh, because of a new world. So we need to consider um, clear going concern um, considerations for various companies. And um, uh, if there are um, conditions or events that cast significant doubt on an entity's ability to continue as a going concern, you, you need to be aware, I'm sure most of you already know, there has to be sufficient disclosures um, uh, in the financial statements for those who are preparers, the accountants, and then for the auditors, uh, your opinion has to be uh, considered what the impact that will be, whether you're having an emphasis of matter um, in your opinion or not. And then a whole lot of work you need to do um, in order to support your opinion, especially looking at future cash flows, uh, looking at business processes and changes management are making and um, ETC. So going concern is a very big consideration everyone must have um, uh, right now in their organization. Um, moving on to another part is the government assistance to be accounted for. Um, you guys on this call may not have too much to worry about government assistance because the only thing you're going to get is one mask. So it's immaterial for accounting purposes. 
but um, you know that's on a lighter note. But anyway, um, if you get uh, government grants, um, um, you have to consider IS-20 on how to account for government grants. This is a moment where uh, many governments are giving assistance to companies. Uh, so uh, IS-20 uh, definitely would, would have to kick in. And in, in simple terms, what is the, uh, the standard tells you is that when you get a government grant, you don't just lump the entire lot in this year and recognize it as a grant on your P and as an income. No, rather, it depends on what the government is helping you with. Um, if the costs, for example, if they are picking up a part of your payroll in order to avoid redundancy, assuming you're in a critical sector and they say, you know, instead of making these people redundant, we're going to, you know, pay the payroll costs and maintain them. Uh, you recognize the, the grant as the service of those people goes on. Um, so if uh, the grant is for, the, say, uh, two years' worth of salary, don't recognize the entire lot in the current year plan deal. You recognize only the current year salary's worth uh, that you have in your pay, uh, payrolls uh, as a grant for this year, and then you defer the rest on the balance sheet. Um, equally, and also goes to the second bullet there, um, there are different forms of um, government grants. If government gives you an asset, a physical PPE, you don't just fair value the entire chunk and um, recognize it as a, an income on your candle to look good, but rather uh, the standard tells you to recognize it also the same principle as the costs um, are being incurred. And the cost for the use of PPE, we all know it's a natural depreciation. So you would have to have a deferred uh, grant on your balance sheet in liabilities, and then you recognize the equivalent of uh, depreciation, uh, both as an income in a grant, and because you have an asset on the balance sheet which was granted, you also depreciate that. So there will be an income and expense which match um, each other. There are a couple of schools of thoughts around accounting for grants, but since I'm pretty sure you are not going to get any, let me not go too much into that because it may not be practical for this year. Then, um, uh, liabilities, liabilities. You've seen so much in the media, uh, uh, laying off people, uh, reducing people's salaries and probably other benefits, uh, and maybe some restructuring of businesses if you had the entire load of branch network and everything. Um, when do you account for uh, provisions and various, um, uh, various other obligations? Uh, COVID-19 has resulted into unavoidable liabilities, that's for sure. Um, so you need to remember as accountants, the conditions under which you recognize a liability is if there is a constructive obligation, IS 37, constructive obligation. If a communication has been made out already, whether through the media or directly to letters to people, it is that you're going to be terminated and these are going to be your benefits. You have to account for that immediately at that point in time, the, the worth of that um, restructure. On the other hand, if there's none, uh, no constructive obligation and, um, you know, and the, the directors are keeping the cards on their chest and not telling anyone, in such a situation, they can't say, but we have this, so, you know, coming up, we've not communicated, but we are sure we know. You know, you can't provide for that if there's no uh, constructive obligation that has been uh, made to, to people. Um, then the other part, sorry guys, my computer has chosen that this is the right moment to snooze. Um, the other part is the, um, we talked about the classification of current and non-current, uh, that one I will not have to repeat, but any obligations that arise out of um, your constructive um, obligations, you need to consider whether they are current or non-current, depending on the, on the timing. Um, revenue. Revenue, you all know IFRS 15 that came up with the five point uh, stages of recognizing revenue. And um, uh, clearly the definition of the contract is the first uh, part of, um, um, uh, of uh, defining, uh, of recognizing revenue. Now, if you have contracts already with customers, you need to ask yourselves, are those contracts still enforceable? If you're in the construction sector and uh, the, you, you were uh, contracted by a hotelier um, to put up a hotel um, or an airline uh, business and they wanted to put a hangar for, you know, uh, parking the, the, their aircrafts. Um, I, don't, I hope it's called parking. Um, so you need to ask yourself whether those contracts are still enforceable. 
um, um, then you need to check whether within your revenue contracts, whether they are variable considerations. For example, if certain conditions were not fulfilled, for example, timing of a delivery or a quota that was supposed to be delivered or any other aspect. With the disruption in the economy right now, there are chances that there are so many conditions within contracts uh, that are not going to be um, fulfilled. So when you are measuring how much revenue to be recognized, if you clearly, that, clearly know that some of those variable um, considerations in those contracts are, uh, are not going to be made, or sorry, or they are going to be made, and therefore revenue price you had anticipated before is going to shrink, you have to account for that now um, as a, a potential loss. Then um, insurance proceeds. In, if at all uh, you, you were clever and you, you knew COVID was coming, you had some links with the, you know, Wuhan, and you insured against you know, business disruption or obsolescence sort of inventory, whatever, whatever um, you, you insured, and then you're getting some insurance money, um, uh, you need to remember, again, IS-37 contingent assets, is that um, only if it's virtually certain, if an underwriter has already assessed that, yes, uh, these conditions have met, have ticked all the boxes from your policy, and this is the amount we're going to pay you, please sign here to confirm that these are your final obligations and therefore no further claim on this contract. Only if, you know, if, if some sort of discussion of that sort has happened, that's when you recognize um, uh, insurance uh, proceeds as a contingent asset. Um, otherwise, uh, then don't. Uh, government grants also follow the same as insurance proceeds. If a government has promised you uh, certainly government, uh, you can't recognize it because that's not virtually certain. Um, uh, then, of course, revenue cycle, you can't talk about it without considering the impact on um, uh, credit loss on receivables. And by the way, what you need to remember as well is that um, the primary definition of when to recognize revenue is uh, if you're virtually certain that you're going to um, have uh, revenue. So you can't recognize revenue and immediately record an impairment by data. No. That recognition of the data um, impairment um, uh, means that you are not virtually certain that you recover that. So um, these factors have to be considered. Employee benefits, um, if I'm talking about say, uh, defined benefit schemes, if salaries have changed, you may need to see whether you need to revise your parameters and um, um, actuarial calculations, uh, demographics in terms of salary levels and um, and, and other areas. Um, if you have share-based payments, uh, which are based on uh, certain trigger events or uh, share price, uh, strike price, or you know, um, of a share of, or, of a net assets of the business, uh, you will find that most of those other employee benefits uh, circumstances now may not be vesting. Um, the terminology normally called here is that you are in the money. Whereas here, you know, in Uganda, it's used even by a layman who is not an accountant. Apparently, actually, that is the technical terminology that um, if your, um, your share-based payments is in the money, um, then you recognize the liability. But if it isn't in the money, then um, you, you may have to remove those if they were already recognized. Uh, so that's an area, again, that will be impacted. Now, um, uh, Final areas uh, that I need to talk about here, lease contracts. We talked a little bit about lease contracts. Those ones I may not need to talk much more about them. Um, what might be important for you to know may be the topic of adjusting versus non-adjusting subsequent events. I try to look out for the timeline of when uh, the World Health Organizations and, um, Organization announced uh, COVID-19 as a pandemic. And it seemed to have been around March. Um, March, that's when it was uh, uh, categorized as a pandemic, even though it started off in China um, much earlier than that. So for all your 31 December 2019 year ends, um, or even if we have a 31, uh, December, uh, 31 uh, January 2020, before it was declared a pandemic, you might find that all these things I'm talking about are subsequent events. You do not go back in the financial statements of last year and now start changing fair values and start changing, you know, um, ECLs and all that stuff. You may need a little bit much more disclosure, um, but um, uh, for 2020, 
uh, for sure, all these things we are talking about uh, are going to have to be considered in the current year financial statements. And that's where also the interim uh, financial statements come in. If you have any uh, especially listed company and you have June financial statements to, to, to prepare, uh, you are now required to consider all these factors and you, the auditors, um, IS-34 uh, requires you to update your understanding um, of the business um, as of the date of half year, and then you make all the accounting policy corrections and adjustments, and if there are any uh, provisions or fair values, they all have to be done as at uh, that, that half year um, interim period. So that's really much it about the accounting considerations. Um, and, and the audit considerations borrow a lot more because once you know the accounting considerations, the audit considerations become a little bit easier because the auditor is coming in to look that are all these risks are addressed and are all these financial instruments are other assets and liabilities accounted for appropriately. And if the auditor answers yes, how he goes about to answer yes, now that's what we're going to cover. But if the auditor answers yes, then that's pretty much it. Um, that's the, the objective of, of, of the audit. So, um, and, and that's the natural place to start is a risk assessment. Uh, I've moved on to a slide that has a heading there, risk assessment. If it's low on your side, uh, bear with me, it will come uh, in a short while. Um, so you will know that from an audit point of view, then we have item, uh, we have the concept of um, significant risk and non-significant risk. We have concepts of inherent risk um, in, in transactions. With COVID-19 and the fact that it has had severe um, disruption to every single business, you're going to have that, um, a situation where inherent risk um, definition is going to cover almost most of the financial statement lines. Um, areas, for example, like revenue. Um, if people are not selling, but they have pressures and all that, um, is there no inherent risk now in revenue recognition this, uh, this period? Areas like receivables, historically, which you didn't um, think they were in, had inherent risk. Um, areas like PPE or inventory, how are you going to count your stocks uh, when you're in lockdown? Uh, so the definition of now inherent risk um, might go in to capture so many um, areas. Then historically, you could have had areas where you, uh, you, you had um, uh, significant risks um, and others which were non-significant risks. So you, again, you're having a situation where you're going to have more significant risks now um, on, your, on, on your audit um, um, approach. Then uh, you may also have totally new um, material risks of material misstatements, especially around all those areas I've talked about, um, inventory, PPE, goodwill, if you didn't previously have them. And then your risk of material misstatement. Uh, risk of material misstatement, of course, looks at a combination of inherent risk and control risk. Now, control risk is very important, and we shall sit in the later slide there. But if uh, the custodians of controls, people who do reconciliations, People who man the stores um, and uh, do the inventory counts, uh, people in production who do production uh, batching and all that, people in marketing, they are not working. They are not there. The custodians of control, controls are literally not operating. Um, you, and then your inherent risk is high. That combination uh, makes the risk of material misstatement very high, almost across board. So this is the concept of risk assessment that uh, COVID-19 brings into um, audit files. Um, fraud risk. I want to spend a little bit time on fraud risk, guys, um, uh, and you bear with me. The rest won't be too long. Fraud. Sorry, all of you remember. CPI said. Yes, please. Yeah, I'm now tight marking you. Yes you, yes, you need to be summarizing. You have quite a number of questions coming through that you need to okay. respond to as well. Yes, okay. thank you. No, no worries. No, uh, okay, so in that spirit, Chair, I'm going to cover this part of risk assessment and maybe just inventory count because I know those are the two areas where, and maybe materiality. I will just cover three areas probably in 10 minutes, then close. So um, fraud, uh, you all remember uh, uh, the fraud triangle. If you vaguely, now that I've spoken, maybe now you have remembered the fraud triangle. Um, fraud happens if there are three items. If there are incentives, um, if there are opportunities, and the third one 
if there are uh, rationalization. Um, if there are incentives, right now, there are uh, businesses, businesses are struggling. If they want to get additional debt, you know, the numbers will bail them out or will throw them away. Um, if they are trying to list, if they have capital requirements, if um, they have any confidence, um, or if they have any significant interest by other parties um, in their financial statements, there is a heightened incentive and pressure for management to misstate financial statements um, in these circumstances. The other corner of the uh, fraud triangle are opportunities. If everyone who is in charge of oversight, if boards are not sitting, they are virtual, if um, people who are supposed to do the, uh, to, to, to man the controls are physically not there, if internal audits which had um, to, to review uh, various processes cannot conduct their, their audits, then the, that corner of opportunity for a fraud perpetrator to execute um, his mission um, is, becomes very easy for it to, 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 to go through. And then the final one is the rationalization. Um, the final corner of the fraud triangle, rationalization. Uh, if people are working virtually, uh, everything is electronic, uh, they might rationalize that. In, and also some of them are fearing that they are going to lose their employment anyway. Um, they might rationalize that, okay, I will be able to f somehow, somewhere, get away with fraud. So with those three um, corners of the triangle complete, COVID-19 is the perfect storm for fraud. And you as auditors, um, you need to keep an eye on, on how um, all this uh, can, can be safeguarded so that uh, we, we maintain public confidence. And then consideration whether you need specialists. I talked a lot about valuations. I talked about actuarial, you know, stuff like that, uh, tax specialists. Um, so you might need to consider whether you need um, all the specialists. Then I'll talk a little bit about materiality. Materiality normally has a concept of a benchmark. Uh, you base your materiality on uh, a number within the financial statements that the users focus more on. If users are focusing more on profit, um, uh, for profit uh, from continuing operations, profit before tax from continuing operations, the question right now is what is the profit before tax from continuing operations? The profit that someone reported at 31 December 2019 is that going to be the profit next year? If you're do, setting your materiality for 2020 now, um, uh, and you're seeing that profit has dipped or even to a loss position, what is the profit? Because normally the standard allows you to normalize. Um, if you anticipate a restructuring and it's a one-off, the standard allows you to remove that cost of restructuring and see the profit um, that is a, from a continuing business. And, um, but now, how are you going to normalize? Is COVID a temporary thing or it's a permanent thing? So I think that is the key area to consider um, with, uh, with materiality. And also the aggregation risk, uh, which is the risk that there may be misstatements scattered all over the set of financial statements. And if they add it together, they become material. Um, and then the other part that I think members would want and probably a question would have come anyway is on inventory. And especially the procedure around inventory count. If you're under lockdown and um, uh, you can't count inventory, there are, uh, there's, there, there, there are fundamental considerations there that we need to know. One, um, if management cancels or postpones an inventory count, um, and you need to assess the reasons uh, for them canceling. Is it because of a lockdown? Um, if it is, then you wait for the lockdown to lift, and then you, you, you perform alternative procedures, which might be you count at a later date, and then reconcile back um, to, the, to the financial reporting debt. And that reconciliation back, it may sound like if a, a lockdown has now gone on every two weeks, uh, 21 days, another two weeks, um, you might find that actually very little volumes are moving in inventory. So that's the comfort you might need to give your clients and your staff that um, the reconciliation process may not be so tedious because there are fewer purchases and fewer sales going on. So you count at a later date and reconcile back. But if management just totally refuse and there's no reason, then as an auditor, you have to consider a limitation of scope in your, in your opinion. On the other hand, is that if management for them, they are uh, in a critical business, uh, the way I think um, uh, 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 Professor mentioned earlier on, that your clients are in a critical business that was allowed for government, uh, by government for, for them to move, and they're able to count, but you as an auditor, you physically cannot go there 
then you consider a couple of options. One extreme is to try to use technology and see whether you can monitor online. But you know that you controlling that is already hard enough than the count itself. The other is to rely on management's count and then you perform alternative procedures to verify that their count was appropriate or you can rely on internal audit, audits work and that's where probably once in a while we might need to rely on internal auditors because the internal auditor may be able to go to that uh, allocation. You issue them instructions, you tell them what to do um, and then you work together, whatever then they produce since you are part of the planning team, it can be accepted by the ISAs. So I think those are the key um, considerations that um, we might need to consider within the inventory count. Um, the rest, Chair, I think I covered all the rest, but um, uh, I think of one final point is to keep communication channels with those charged with governance open um, for all those that are within the financial reporting responsibilities, accountants, uh, look at this as a nice topic your board members will always want to know about and the various aspects that I've talked about let them not be caught by surprise and um, notify them uh, where they are going to get hits, where uh, profit warnings, etc. Don't be forced to, uh, to, to, to give a rosy picture just because the budgets they set were tough. This might be the moment where you, you can easily renegotiate budget. So keeping communication channels with those charged with governance is very important. Equally to the auditors, uh, the extent of um, uh, audit risk and the extent of audit procedures now we have to perform and the fact that they have to be virtual it's important to tell uh, the audit committees about the depth of, of, of this issue to their particular business and so that there is an open um, two-way communication with those charged with governance. With that, Chair, I think I can now keep quiet. Thank you. Thank you so, so, so much, CPS said. And um, I think from, uh, from the comments that I'm seeing here, I can only repeat and say thank you for the good job and um, also together with the professor, I hope he's still on. Uh, thank you for doing justice to this topic. Of course, ordinarily, this is not a topic that you would, do. You would discuss in one, in one hour and a few minutes. This is something that could take days, but the way you've compressed it and uh, given us a lot of information within this short time is really credible and we thank you so much. So thank you, Professor. Thank you, CP Asad, for the, for the presentations. Now, from the question and answer board, uh, there are quite a number of them and uh, I will, some of them will pass for comments, but I'm going to quickly run through them uh, so that um, between uh, Professor and CP Asad, you can decide who answers which one or who makes a comment on which one, okay? Uh, so let me move very fast. The first question is, please comment on the sufficiency and appropriateness of audit evidence in the context of an auditor who is unable to physically inter interface with the client. Do we see possible comprom compromises in audit quality? Are the resulting audit opinions still reliable? Uh, that is uh, one big question that comes out. Um, I will be jumping questions that are related to what I've already read. Um, this one is specific to Associate Professor uh, Kawase. In regard to smaller firms where you have a lot of experience in, you know, even at IFAC level, uh, the, the person who has posted this question is saying he expects to see most of their clientele go out of business. What, are, what is the chance? What chance is there for these firms to merge and benefit from economies of scale? He's talking about mergers. And um, relatedly, there is a, a question of how, how, how do you advise the small practitioners to get business in the midst of this COVID uh, pandemic. So that one is specific to Professor Kawase. Okay, the, another person is asking in terms of charging, what is the best model for charging out fees, audit fees during this COVID-19 period? 
uh, the next question. Uh, my panelists, I, I, I hope uh, I, I hope you are you are listening. Yes, chairman. Yes, oh, yes. Very good. Very good. Chairman, we are here. If I'm too fast, you can alert me because you need to get the questions right. Some of these questions for me, I've been answering them as they're coming. I don't know whether people show the answers. Oh, okay. Mm. Okay, so th that, is, that, that is good because it, they, they appeared on the, on the Q&A board. Yes, okay. but continue. All right, thank you. Uh, in, in special purpose audits, there is a question here talking about special purpose audits, say grants, grant audits. Can a wrong date on an invoice uh, be sufficient evidence to conclude that the entire procurement was, was not given due care and does it lead to a qualified opinion? And, and, and the question goes on to say, all the other supporting documents being fine with only invoices dated before contract signing dates in error, for example. Um, maybe that's a hypothetical one, but you can comment on it. Uh, another question is, uh, businesses are considering going concern the businesses that are considered going concern in the next one year. But because you have to make bold decisions that include cost reduction and restructuring, these are like short term. However, given the current, the current situation, there is some uncertainty in the next six to eight months. What comment do you have on this particular scenario? Yeah, questions on NSSF, I think this one I'm not going to, to, to pause, but people are asking you to comment on NSSF, the proposed 20% payout. Uh, maybe if you have time at the very end, you can, you can comment, but I think it's not related to the subject of today. Um, the other question is, uh, uh, when in this lockdown, The assignments which are in progress, uh, the auditors are already engaged. Might there be an IT platform that could link up, that could link up with this, the client system for an effective audit to be conducted with no interruption to the, to the client? What is the institute bringing away? In other words, the questions are typed. I'm trying to make sense out of them. Then what is the institute bringing on board for uniformity of an audit exercise for its practitioners? I personally find it challenging for a client to scan documents that we need uh, in the process of audits. Now, at the end of this, I know the CEO of the institute is on this call and the president also is on call. I may request them at the very, very end to make a comment on this particular one, on what the Institute is doing um, about bringing some, some uniformity of, in the audit exercise, okay? Uh, this question is specific to CPA Assad. Would the firm's ability to pro prioritize quality control processes ensure better management of audits? Also maintaining clarity, uh, uh, also maintaining clarity, and, and, it is, and the question is a bit vague there, there is a typo, but it's talking about close attention being paid at planning stages for increased tests for fraud, ETC. I hope you can make sense out of that question, CPS said. Um, let me move on to transparency. Uh, a tracking and accounting transparently for resources deployed during such emergency times like COVID-19 is a key challenge for both accountants and auditors. How do you advise auditors to deal with the situations where key processes were skipped or ignored to address the emergency? Okay, uh, this one is about capital. Uh, what happens when shareholders have contributed a lot of capital to the company and they are not sure whether they will ever break even or recoup their capital? Can they turn, 
return it to equity by increasing share capital through a resolution and registration of issued up, uh, issued up share capital or pay up the stamp duty thereon. They are on. Okay. No. Yeah, uh, yeah. Come, again, come again on that question, it's not clear. Okay, uh, it's a question which says that what happens when shareholders have contributed a lot of capital to the company and they are not sure when they will ever break even to recoup their capital. So I'm imagining this could be some, some kind of shareholder loan. Yeah, they're asking, can, can they turn this into equity? Uh, by increasing share capital via resolution and, and registration of the stamp. Is that clear now? Yes, it is. Very good, thank you. And uh, then there is, a, there, is an, a, there is a question from an internal auditor's point of view here. Uh, in the context of internal audit and internal control reviews, what are your thoughts on assurance over changing processes? Uh, some processes and controls cannot be performed as initially planned or have to operate in a crisis mode with fewer staff and reduced mobility. Take on yeah, that is a, from an internal audit perspective. Uh, another one, Asad, directly to you, CPA Asad, is that um, if I'm using the backstop approach for my definition of a significant increase in credit risk, how would you anticipate any different approach given the COVID-19 response actions? If I'm using the backstop approach for my definition of significant increase in credit risk, how would you anticipate any different approach given the COVID-19 response actions? And two, how would you approach a situation where my professional assessment differs from the forecasted macroeconomic variables um, given by renowned publishing houses. Okay, then there's something about government grants that you mentioned in your presentation, CPA said. Um, you said government grants need to be accounted for in a given financial year and the other portion deferred. How about government agencies that operate a cash basis budget of which su such grants are tagged to a given financial year? How do you advise on the recognition in the books of accounts? And very lastly, again to CPR said, uh, on IFRS 9, theoretically IFRS 9, expect, IFRS 9 expected credit loss requires assessing if the financial asset has, has insignificant, significant, I mean, has insignificant I think all significant risk of default, or if the credit risk is, impa is impaired, and measure the impairment for 12 month period or remaining life. Could you please clarify um, with some kind of practical touch what exactly has to be done? I, I don't know whether CPS said you've made sense out of that question. Yeah, I'm trying to. <laughs> I'm trying to, I know it's uh, to do the 12 month ECL versus, versus yeah, or, or remaining or remaining life. Eh? Mm. So he's asking, the person is asking to, uh, for clarity in that area. So those are the questions that have come through. So um, between the two of you, if you could just uh, spend a few minutes and speak to them. Um, we are, we are actually running behind our schedule, but try to see how you can quickly respond to them. Thank you so much. Chair, Chair, I think let me do a quick run through those general ones. Um, somebody commented on the uh, audit quality vis-a-vis -vis, uh, in, in an era where fiscal interference is a problem. Uh, our audit opinion is still reliable. I would just say one thing, one answer is that uh, AISAs are still applicable. All AISAs as we know them, they are still applicable. We must have uh, sufficient and appropriate audit evidence. There are no shortcuts. So you have to look or use alternative audit procedures to ensure that uh, you get the appropriate and audit evidence. Of course, there is a, a challenge on date quality, but are used as applicable. SMPs, clients going out of business, can we match? 
Uh, this debate has been on the table, and uh, what is important is to understand why SMPs are not matching. What is it that is stopping us from uh, matching? If COVID-19 has come to help us match, so be it. We'll be able to assess each other and work together. Uh, what is the best costing model? Uh, sorry, uh, how do we price ourselves? Um, well, in Uganda, maybe in the big force, but where I sit from, um, we, we, we negotiate audit fees. <laughs> uh, we, we don't go into uh, working that day, um, worksheets and this kind of uh, clocking and time-based kind of costing. We negotiate cost fees, but of course, as we negotiate, you should have done your costing properly. So therefore, uh, when you do the, the, the direct cost of human resource, the overheads, you add on a margin. So in terms of uh, COVID, in times of COVID, it's about negotiation. Don't negotiate out of margin. <laughs> you can play around with the margin, but don't go and don't eat into the cost. Uh, a debt is missing on the invoice, but all other supporting documents are okay. Um, well, this is, is it a reasonable assurance audit? We are looking for uh, reasonable assurance and not absolute assurance. It depends. If you're looking for absolute assurance and your IGG, uh, well, you may be in for a debt on invoice, but uh, if it's reasonable assurance, I go for the reasonable assurance and look at the other evidence. Um, I may not have to jump out of my skin because of the debt. Um, going concern, Trico, yes, we always see that the company will be a going concern looking forward into the foreseeable future. Uh, I would answer this by saying that we need to put our out risk antennas on the high. Uh, Asad has well elaborated on this. Yeah, this is one area we have to have uh, be on the high alert. I will not comment on pay uh, NSS of 20% payout. I will just say Mundo Mukavi, Mundo Dara. That's, a, that's the only comment I, I, I'll use. <laughs> uh, can we get uh, data from the client and integrate it in our system? Yes, you can import the data and be able to do your data analytics. But you need to support your data analytics uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, a document, for example. In such instances, you may want to have uh, a scan document, but be careful with the scanning. With the scanning, um, maybe I can take this together with the uniformity of evidence. Uh, scanning, um, you, you can use your, your professional skepticism. If you have queried uh, a transaction and you only accept the, 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 scan, the scan from an email of the CFO, Try to say that you scan, but let the MOD uh, send the, the document so that the MOD is aware of what is being sent to you. Or if the MOD is, uh, you're also suspicious that the MOD may be in it, then uh, escalate to the chair, audit and risk committee. What is important here is to use your professional skepticism on this document, but the scanning may be the only way out of the situation. Transparency and then cutting corners in the name of emergency. No, uh, I don't believe in this. That because locusts have come, then we do this. No, I, I think processes and procedures we are put in place, they still have to be followed. If you don't want to put processes and procedures, don't do the assignment until you have come back to say what are the necessary processes and procedures to address an emergency. First, have a process, but if you have not, change the process, please go back and follow those processes. Uh, converting loans into equity, this is possible. I don't see why, but if you are, uh, if it is equity, you, you set up a company and brought in the equity, definitely you are in for, uh, for good or for worse. Uh, you, are the, you are the last person to be paid even in terms of uh, liquidation. So I hand over to my colleague to answer the hard questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You've actually answered the hardest. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> yes, um, I think um, uh, I'll pick one or two as well, uh, plus the ones that um, were addressed to me personally. 
I liked the first, the very first one, which I, I, I know um, which was answered as well, compromising audit quality due to inability to interact and, and um, with, with teams and working remotely. Uh, that's a question that when you, you see the way it's even framed, uh, that sounds like a user of financial statements uh, and relies on financial statements um, that are issued to that person. And to me, it's a very good question. And it's a, a question that uh, represents what most of the users will have um, towards us, the CPAs on this call, both those who are preparing financial statements and those who are in charge of auditing those financial statements. And um, certainly the environment is disruptive and it can easily affect um, audit quality or um, uh, we as CPAs will uh, step up to the challenge and we find that working remotely is also possible and we continue to comply with all the standards, the IFRSs and the ISAs in order to play our part. Um, so uh, I, I think you can't really say that uh, quality will be compromised. But what you can say is that there is a significant risk in financial reporting right now that uh, between the accountants that, and auditors have to ensure that they address that risk um, satisfactorily. Then there was a question around um, going concern that if there's a restructuring um, happening uh, and but still there are going to be uncertainties in the next six to eight months uh, and the question was does this affect uh, the conclusion on the going concern assumption uh, you see you can't answer a going concern question like that a going concern question is unique to every single entity and the going concern question uh, the, the standard the only thing the standard tells you is that you look at going concern um, going concern for a period of a minimum of 12 months from the date when you're issuing an opinion. So if you look at the forecasts and um, you, you look at your, the, the liquidity and um, income and, and, and all other parameters plus the, the liabilities and assets you have, and you see that uh, there's actually a real possibility you're going to fail. If, for example, you, you, you're an airliner, um, you know, or you're in a tour, you have a camp, um, somewhere in, in windy or somewhere, and uh, that's your business, uh, you, you can attempt to say this is a temporary situation, but when you try to do all the bookings and, um, and reach out all your usual customers and agents, and they're clearly showing you, and they, they've historically been booking years in advance or months in advance, you can't say this is a temporary situation. So you'd have to look at each of the circumstances um, in their own um, unique situation. But the standard tells you, look at 12 months, and see whether there is a risk, if there's a material risk. Now, the word material is a judgmental part that, you know, everyone who would be involved from the board to finance to um, external auditors would then, all of them have to sit together and see what is material uh, risk of um, going concern. So it can't be answered on a forum like this, but uh, we can give those sorts of um, um, pointers. The IT platform to link audit processes and, um, and uh, clients I think there are some, there are some public uh, platforms or some which you might need to buy if you exceed a certain quota. So you might just need to check out um, uh, the, the data dumping, um, you know, those cloud services where you can, um, if someone is seated somewhere, they can put information on that cloud um, root server. And then where you are, they share with you a password and will give you access remotely. And then you can go directly onto that, um, that link and you pick all the information. So you might need to explore that at a personal level um, and see the, the secure uh, platforms. You need to actually emphasize the security um, of that platform because of confidentiality uh, conditions we always have in our engagement letters and, um, in the, and the code of conduct. Um, then, uh, uh, there was a question uh, to me directly, I think, about the share capital. Um, if, and you rightly, Chair, I think, tweaked it a little bit and said that if um, shareholders had contributed a lot of capital, let me assume that was uh, money in form of loan um, into an entity and they don't see uh, an end to the tunnel, um, can they convert that into equity? Absolutely, yes. Uh, and that would be really a very good way um, of you leading your organization as a shareholder. Um, because then the balance sheet will look better um, and also the commitment um, uh, would, would, uh, would look better um, uh, to, towards your, your management if you're a shareholder. Yes, and you're right, uh, stamp duty unfortunately accrues immediately 
uh, on this call, they are tax experts who will tell you that the conditions for paying a tax to your RA is upon, um, uh, is it the earlier of provision of the service, uh, issuance of the invoice, or, you know, accrual or something like that. They, 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 I think when, as soon as you make that decision and uh, you, you convert, then unfortunately some duty might, might kick in um, for you. And it's a, it's a lot of money, unfortunately, as well. And that has a real cash flow impact. So you need to think through that and uh, engage some tax consultants to, to give you the best solution. Um, yeah, someone asked about the significant increase in credit risk and, um, and how COVID-19 uh, would affect that if the, the person said if they're using a backstop, um, a backstop approach. Um, you see significant increase in credit risk. They're, they're, it's not a static position. You know, everyone, everyone you lend to would have um, uh, some degree of credit risk. You can lend someone on day one and you charge them an interest rate of say 30%, like a microfinance, but another one, uh, or you lend to another party at say 5%, if it's a huge financial institution or in a foreign currency denominated uh, loan. Uh, now, significant increase in credit risk um, is measured from that point for each of those parties um, subsequently. If um, the one that you thought had a lower risk um, shows signs of default, then their credit risk has increased. And therefore, they will jump from uh, uh, stage one to stage two, or stage two to stage three, or even straight from stage one to stage, two to stage three. So the significant increase in credit risk will always have to be revised every time there are um, any, any such indicators that are different from the date when you, have, you set out your risk assessment of that particular uh, party. So you, you can't have a fixated position. And even if the entity is going under, if, even if it's losing customers left, right, center, even if, um, you know, uh, the, the customers are not paying or your factory is closed, you can't have a static position just because you chose a certain accounting policy. Um, and typically, that's us as accountants, we need to make sure that uh, the choice of accounting policies speaks to the commercial side of the business, um, not used to fix um, uh, numbers. So you can't have a customer whose business has actually deteriorated, and you say because of the approach you use to assess significant increase in credit risk, you're not changing your ECL, um, yet the commercial side is telling you that we are losing money on this guy. So to me, I think that's a, a core principle in accounting to ensure that it's aligned uh, to the commercial side um, of transactions. Um, then uh, government grants for MDS. Yes, uh, I, I don't know that I would call it a government grant or a budget allocation. I think there's a whole lot of different accounting framework for the IPSAs, for um, uh, uh, MDS, government institutions. So yes, you're, you're totally right. IS-20 um, would be slightly modified for accounting for government-related um, uh, uh, transactions. Then someone asked about um, uh, 12 months ECL versus lifetime ECL um, in IFRS 9. And um, I think if I remember correct how the question was phrased, that is uh, to assess if a financial asset has a significant risk of default, when do you use I, um, 12 months versus when do you use a lifetime ECL? Uh, 12 months, I think the blanket definition, and actually I think guys, uh, fellow CPAs, is that the new standard IFRS 9 uh, just came in at the right time for this term because the old standard we had, IS 39, was not, was not going to be able to cope with this, uh, these accounting challenges. And also that's why you know, it came after the credit crunch because people were only seeing the losses after they've uh, already been incurred and they were not able to make decisions based on the future, you know, prospect of the business yet they're investing in the future. So um, 12 months ECL um, is already an existing principle within the IFRS 9 and it's applied on where you have uh, uh, stage one, um, stage one um, assets and stage one assets are those assets that have not shown any change in significant increase in credit risk they have not shown any significant increase in credit risk from the date when you took on those instruments. The moment there is some degree of increase in credit risk, then they go to stage two, and then you have to do both uh, 12 months and uh, lifetime uh, um, expected credit loss calculation. 
And lifetime means that if it's a, a loan, for example, your, your bank or microfinance and you gave out a term loan of four years, um, if you're still in within uh, stage one, you just see the expected credit loss within 12 months. That would be sufficient. But the moment there's a signs that uh, there's a, a significant increase in credit risk, then you'd have to assess the uh, exposure uh, to, to loss all the way to the fourth year, um, working out the uh, prediction of cash flows and incorporating also macroeconomic variables. In fact, this is also a right moment to talk about the person who said um, if in his professional assessment, his macroeconomic variables differ from the professionals. I, I would say, I think, I think, I, I don't know whether that condition within our code of conduct as accountant is still there to not pretend to have technical expertise where you aren't. So for example, if your boss is saying, this is the inflation uh, that is expected. If IMF is saying the GDP of Uganda is going to be like this two, three, four years, I really cannot stand on my feet here and say, based on my professional assessment, me as Assad, uh, in this ECL, I'm going to use this macroeconomic variable. I think professionally, you would have got off the rail from your core, um, uh, your core uh, code of conduct as an accountant. So I would discourage going past pro what professionals have said um, when coming up with these um, variables. So that's all I think. Uh, to do with the questions. I don't think there was any other question between me and uh, Hajj that we've not covered. Okay, thank you so much, um, Associate Professor um, and CP Asad for ably, you know, tackling those questions. Of course, like I said, uh, this is a very big topic that we can actually, you know, go through here in a week and still will not be able to finish. But uh, you know our time is up. But uh, before before we leave, uh, I would like the the institute to to just flash, you know the the coming the coming webinars. Uh, if you can just do that very quickly. Um, and at this time, uh, members, I want to take this opportunity to thank you so much for your participation. Uh, I know we peaked at 510 participants at one point, and uh, this is commendable. I, I cannot take this for granted. I want to say thank you so much for turning up. Now, before we, we conclude, there was something about the institutes, uh, how the institute is coming in to, to help farms. And I know Derek is, um, is on this call. Uh, Derek, do you have any update on this on this matter? For the benefit of the members, yeah. Uh, probably I'll ask the president to speak because uh, I didn't hear the specifics. The only specific I had was on uh, uniformity on edit quality. Yes, that's the one, that's the one. Okay, now for that one, uh, I'm glad that uh, CPA associate professor is, was, is the one who made the presentation. He leads or is part of the committee that is trying to put together a mechanism that can bring together practitioners. Practitioners uh, may un appreciate that there are certain things that are desirable, but which under the current framework of regulation may not be necessarily done by ICPAU, although ICPAU can support. So as the Institute, what we are trying to do is to create really a practitioner's vehicle, where common things are agreed and then they are driven in that regard, not necessarily by the Institute, but by the practitioners with the support of the Institute. That's what okay. I can say for now. Yes. Okay. Th thank you so much, Derek. And uh, just before before we close, uh, I would like to invite uh, my president. I think he's on call. Um, there is an issue that uh, has come up on the on the on the chat here regarding um, regarding whether accountancy is uh, is an essential or a non essential service. Uh, maybe. If we could just call upon the president to 
to, to update the members on, uh, on what is going on on that front. Mr. President, sir. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chair, and uh, my very special thanks to Professor uh, Dr. Hajo Wechtiwa. The only title he doesn't have is that of Sir Longo. Maybe it is in the pipeline. Uh, and uh, yes, Asad, <laughs> Asad, for a very wonderful presentation that you have made. Mr. President, that's CV, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, my apologies. My real apologies. Continue, um, continue. Uh, both, both presenters have done us really very, very well. We have uh, learned a lot. Um, perhaps if I comment on uh, the issue of whether, whether we are regarded as essential or not, uh, I, I, the, the issue of audit quality also rests at the, at the very bottom of my heart. And since we have so many practitioners and people who are paying attention to the profession, it's very important to note that with technology, the very things that you do in a physical audit, you can do with technology. And the, for example, take for example, you go to a client's place and ask for vouchers and ask that they are photocopied so that you retain audit evidence. If you are at a distance and you ask for those vouchers to be scanned for you, the cost is reduced for the client and for you as well. So I think it's important that we see technology from a, a, a positive light rather than from a negative light. Of course, we don't have the requisite infrastructure around the country for our clients to be able to interface with us. But what I appreciate most is that most of our clients have, uh, have phones, have a mobile phone. This smartphone that you're using to be able to log into this webinar is a very powerful tool. Do not use it only for WhatsApp and for Facebook and for calling. It has a lot more that it can offer you. For example, uh, the other day I was guiding somebody on how to attract audit evidence and retain it using an application called Google Duo, Duo as in two, Google Duo. That app is able to scan a document in real time from the client's place onto your, onto your gadget without you having even asked to ask the client to scan it for you. We're using it where you, you say, I need to look at this voucher. You look at the voucher, it scans it from that distance and you retain the evidence that you need. So I think we need to embrace technology as a way of enhancing and reducing our costs and enhancing our fees. Because the amount of cost that you incur to send a staff to be able to go to a particular place, collect this evidence, the risks that you have, the fuel that you have to, to, to drive, the suit that you have to put on, the food that you have to eat, all those costs are cut out. So me, I'm enjoying this lockdown and the, and the lifting and locking of the lock, lockdown because it has helped me discover a number of things. Now back to the core point. Uh, well, the, the question of whether professional accountants should have been classified as essential or not is a very dicey question. In fact, Haji Kawasi sent me a message this morning saying, this is something we should fight because the number of things, they have implications that they have not looked at. How are people going to file their, their tax returns? How are they filing their accounts? Insurance companies, financial institutions, microfinance institutions, regulated entities. I mean, these are things that uh, ordinary people don't pay attention to that detail. But there is something else that we are forgetting that even though the president might have not said you are, you are classified as essential, if government agencies and departments and those other social services are still running, who is the, who is the engine behind them? There's something that is not being said that you don't have to be disheartened about, that you see because I've not been classified as essential. Somebody's running those services and the accountant is behind each of those areas, each of those businesses, each of those units in the economy that is running cannot run without an accountant. So whereas I have spoken with the Auditor General, uh, I think I met him yesterday together with his assistant, and hinted that this is something that they need to actually hint to those that matter, that uh, many of these things cannot go on without the working of the accountant behind the curtains. Uh, whereas we're also speaking directly with regulators, uh, people who are running the regu uh, regulated entities, to assure them that you see certain things are going to be delayed. We also think that it is important that every person on this forum, every accountant on this forum, adds their voice to ours to determine how things go. The other day I was speaking with a commissioner in the, in the Uganda Revenue Authority and I asked her, how are they expecting us to file returns when we are still locked down? 
And she said, but I, I'm seeing many accountants walking here. How are they doing that? The accountants and the client entities are offering transport to come and pick these accountants from wherever they are to be able to take them to be able to comply with regulation. And I think if this voice came out from a unified point of view and from every corner, that you know, before we do this, we need these guys uh, to be able to help us on this. This would have been a long solved problem. Uh, I am still hoping that the clarifications that His Excellency the President will make today will include uh, a clear lifting of uh, the lockdown or uh, a clear lifting of uh, what, whatever sanctions and roadblocks there are. Otherwise, short of that, we should still pursue the agenda of making sure that there is a leeway opened up for professional accountants to be, to, to be able to perform their job as they should. Uh, those that uh, need to file should be able to file. Those that need to be able to help their clients can be able to do that so that the economy is not hurt further. Otherwise, thank you very, very much. Um, I still, I, I think I still owe everybody thanks for this 500 people, 510 people that have attended this, uh, this webinar and have engaged meaningfully to be able to enhance our technical capacity. And please continue to attend as many more others. We come out of this COVID better than we ever have been. Thank you and good evening. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. President. In fact, you've, you've done two things. You've made a clarification, but also I don't know whether knowingly or unknowingly you actually gave, gave a vote of thanks to our presenters. So thank you so much. <laughs> I think that was, that, was, that was the best vote of thanks that uh, we could afford as, uh, as an institute. Thank you so much. And members, uh, we've come to the end of this webinar and uh, I'm sincerely uh, grateful to all of you who have made it and uh, thank you very much once again. Uh, I think we should be seeing you in another two days from now for another, for, for, oh, for another webinar. Oh, oh, Constant, there was also the question of whether the poll questions can be included in the webinar. I think, I think that is something the Secretariat should think through. So that as the presenter presents, sample questions can be raised and answered, and we get to collect that. I think it was raised uh, in very good spirit. Yeah, thank you, thank you, President, for that uh, for that clarification. I think this is noted. Uh, the institute people will, the secretariat will uh, will take that up accordingly. But thank you very much once again, members, and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.